is it time to abandon trans rectal biopsy? And that's the only way I'm going to have any chance at winning this uh, argument is, are we, is that, if that's specifically what we're talking about, then I have a chance. All right, so we'll keep going. Um, but you have to ask, what, what are we talking about? Are we talking about cancer detection rate? Are we talking about infection risk? What, how does this play into MRI fusion and what we're doing? Cost and unfortunately convenience for the patient and for the doctors. And that's probably what has been the biggest barrier uh, to adopting transperineal biopsy. Uh, let's talk about cancer detection rate. There have been a variety of publications that have been out there. Uh, and at first it was to question whether transperineal was as good as transrectal. I think the reality is, is that most of us know that we did a very poor job with template biopsies. First, the original sexton biopsies, followed by 8, then 10, then 12 cores. And now we're all using MR fusion to identify what the right uh, number of cores and where to biopsy. And where are we biopsying with MRI fusion? I'm not trying to make the argument for transperineal, but it's these anterior tumors. So there have been publications such as this in which both approaches were assessed. In, these, in this case, it was 246 patients. Uh, they randomized them and they were able to identify cancer detection rates uh, in both, and they were roughly equal uh, in transrectal and transperineal. There's also been studies where they've taken radical prostatectomy specimens and correlated them with transperineal and transrectal biopsies, and they were equal in the detection rate, but transperineal was better at identifying anterior tumors. And then if you do what Dave has shown, you know, the template where you can map, and he's demonstrated that with radical prostatectomy, it was remarkable how it correlated with, you know, you could actually identify a tumor and follow that actual site. And that, that's really a, a challenge to do transrectal. Um, so I, I'm, I have no problem conceding that the prostate cancer detection rate is equal, and the anterior uh, tumors are easier, obviously, with transperineal. And I'm willing to concede that, obviously, if we're talking about infection risk, uh, transperineal is clearly superior. I mean, you're going through the skin, and I like that, transfecal. And you know, Declan is a good buddy of mine, and, and he has been doing uh, transperineal, and I want you to know that the practice in Australia is very different than the practice here. The practice in the UK is very different than all the, pra the practices that all of y'all have here in the workflow, in how they run their practices, because a lot of them have public practices and private practices, and unfortunately, we have to look at that. We cannot escape the fact that cost comes into play, how you run your, your uh, operating room, how you run your office, how you run your small procedure suite in your office, and, and you can't ignore that. But yes, it is true that hospital admissions are significantly lower with transperineal. And they're, depending on which study you look at, uh, and this is a very busy slide, but it basically, if you could see it, it highlights, and you know, this is something, uh, Stacey Loeb has done a lot of work in infection risk. She's looked at a variety of screening studies, had access to the data, and was able to demonstrate that while there is a very real risk of infection, and if you were to look at these numbers, these are all the transrectal ultrasound guided range uh, up to almost 7%, and the transperineal, you see 0% or just slightly uh, uh, above 0%. Then come the great papers of these uh, experts like Dr. Crawford looking at complication. And this is one thing we do need to think about. What kind of complications do we get with transperineal? And when you look at the difference between a transperineal and transrectal biopsy, there is a slight increase in urinary retention. That has been demonstrated uh, in a variety of studies. Now, it's correlated more to the size of the prostate and age. Uh, in this paper, they are able to assess various different factors that may have contributed to the risk of urinary retention. Uh, but again, the take home is that uh, infections are higher after transrectal uh, and transperineal was associated slightly with uh, increased risk of uh, urinary retention. You know, in the era of MRI imaging, I think we've all changed in our practices. Uh, we are using MR fusion a lot more. When we first started with it in our practice, we did it in the operating room. We now do it in the office. It's very quick. It's very efficient. Uh, but I will tell you that men are very different sp species, I would like to say, uh, than women. Women are clearly the stronger sex, without a doubt, right? You tell a man that uh, he has to have a digital rectal exam. I mean, I, I've sat on panels where we have debated whether or not to recommend DRE because it might impact men looking or seeking out screening for prostate cancer, that that actually may prevent a man from getting an exam 
because he can't get a, you know, a digital rectal exam, a finger in his bottom for about two or three seconds. I mean, it's like the world comes crashing down, uh, down around him. And I tell my male patients when they ask, well, are you going to do this in the office, this biopsy? I say, well, listen, our wives, our sisters, our mothers, all the, our daughters, all the women of our lives have endured very uncomfortable exams since they were teenagers. Uh, and we don't hear about it. We don't hear them complain. Uh, you can man up for 10 minutes for a biopsy. Uh, so I try to get them to accept that, but let me tell you, they are resistant. And anything that lengthens that biopsy, that makes it more uncomfortable, is going to make it a challenge to get these procedures done. Now, you could say when we do transperineal and we can do MR fusion, we can do it in the operating room with general anesthesia. But in today's era of cost containment, uh, that may be a challenge as well. So I still think that um, with MR fusion, being able to do it in the office very efficiently and very quickly, uh, we need to keep our complexity of these procedures done considering that uh, these patients really don't want to have these biopsies in the first place. What are some of the advantages of MR? We talked about this and everyone knows this. It identifies clinics, clinically significant cancers. And I have thought about this that when MR came along, this may affect uh, the amazing ability of targeting that uh, Dave has shown in his transperineal work. The real problem is standardization, to use endorectal coil. For those of you that use endorectal coil in imaging, patients despise that. They hate anything in their bottom. Uh, so I, I think these are all things that uh, will play a role. What about cost? You know, we're talking about cost all the time. We're even talking about how we're not even supposed to be looking for prostate cancer. It's funny, uh, we're not supposed to be looking for cancer. But yet everything we do nowadays for prostate cancer is more expensive with everything we add, whether it's systemic therapy that goes on indefinitely for eight to $10,000 a month, uh, whether it's MR fusion now being introduced into it, uh, whether it's using fancy imaging that now we're going to go and do salvage lymphadenectomy for that may or may not have any impact whatsoever. Um, but we do need to think about cost. And unfortunately, taking patients to the operating room, putting them to sleep does cost quite a bit more. Uh, and in this study, John Davis and the group down at, at Anderson, they looked at patients that underwent trust, standard trust, sedation with trust, not just local, general anesthesia transperineal, sedation fusion biopsy, and sedation inborn MRI biopsy. And basically what they found was that if you used trust biopsy as the referent, Sedation trust was about almost two times as expensive, or 90% more expensive. When you threw in general anesthesia with transperineal, which is how they did it, and I'm sure someone can come up with a way to do it uh, with uh, local in the office, um, it was two and a half times more expensive. So anytime you added that sedation, and a lot of us urologists can't do sedation. I, I don't know about you all, but I'm not licensed to give sedation in my office like a gastroenterologist. Either I'm giving local or I go to the operating room. Um, but it definitely was more expensive. So why do I think that transrectal ultrasound biopsy is not going to go away? And it really comes down to this, and it comes down to convenience. Um, they can be done in the office setting. You can inject lidocaine. People have come up with a variety of different ways to do that. Everyone's got their own way and, of injecting, whether it's at the tip of the seminal vesicles, whether it's all the way along the rectal wall. Um, and most transperineal biopsies, and I'm sure someone can tell me that they're able to do it local, but I believe, I could be wrong, most are, being, are done with a general anesthetic in the operating room with the classic brachyte uh, brachytherapy uh, you know, template. Um, and retention is higher with the transperineal approach, but I suspect you could you know, pick your patients appropriately. And it really comes down to this. It comes down to logistics like with anything else. I think complexity of getting something done, if you're trying to get cases done, get these patients uh, uh, moved along uh, through their care, it's probably gonna be a bigger challenge to get them to the OR, because you may even have limited OR time. So in summary, I have, it's clear that transperineal approach is gonna have a lower infection risk. Now, I do wanna point out, if everyone's ever followed Stacy Loeb, who is prolific when it comes to uh, risk of UTI and post-biopsy sepsis in the literature. Um, you know, it, people have had to downplay the, this concern. You know, when you really look at the numbers, significant life-threatening infections are somewhere in the order of about 2 to 3%. It's not 10%. It's not 20%. Now, it is nice that transperineal is, they average it around 0.7%. <laughs> so that is better. But remember, clinical significance and statistical significance are two different things. You know, going from 0.7 to 2%, you have to ask yourself, what's the difference? I think it's really the, what, what Kelly had talked about, which is uh, you know, the problems we're having with resistance with antibiotics. But the bottom line is transrectal uh, prostate biopsy is easier for most urologists. 
And uh, it's easier for patients. They come in, they get it done, they move along. And uh, I think ultimately what's going to happen is we're going to tailor this technique. I do think we're going to see a rise in transperineal. But are we going to completely abandon transrectal? I feel very confident that I'm going to say, of course not. Uh, I don't see that happening anytime in the near future, and I do not think it's time to abandon that approach, which if that's the specific question we're asking, not risk of infection, not being put to sleep, pain and all that, I, I feel confident that we're not going to abandon it. Do we need to consider increased application of transperineal biopsy? Absolutely. And I will want to point something out about that Twitter poll. You know, most surgeons anyways don't usually go to the doctor or go and get procedures done because we're, we're smarter than that. <laughs> so it doesn't surprise me that doctors would say they'd rather have the transperineal approach because uh, we've seen our patients squirm on the table, and we're pretty wimpy when it comes down to that anyways. Um, so here's the same question, and of course uh, the answer was 1 to 7%. So thank you for your attention.